you got your Bible, get your Bible in hand. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer as we prepare our hearts to receive from the word of the Lord. Come on, let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful this weekend, God, that we can gather in homes as your church, God. That, Lord, distance and time may be separating us, but, God, we are of one accord and one spirit. Your body linked up our hearts and your heart, God, together, Lord, as one. We thank you for the unity in the body of Christ, Lord. And many churches have had to shut their doors and go online, and all of us, God, have been thrown into this same boat, Lord. And here we are, God, asking you to bless the church services and bless all of the churches here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. And today, Lord, as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding, and may we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. We thank you that today it's not a man or a woman, not the young or the old, not the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine, but God, we came to hear from you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher of the church. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, your correction. God, where we've gotten off track, get us back on track with you, we pray, Lord. And Father God, we don't just ask this blessing for ourselves only, God. We would ask it for all the churches, God, that you would speak to them and be in their midst, Lord God. Be in the midst of every home gathering, God, every fellowship, Lord God. We thank you for what you're doing, God, that the spirit is not bound by time or space, but that you can transfer and translate your goodness and your word to our hearts wherever we're at, God. We give you thanks and praise. Lord, this weekend, God, we also want to lift up the persecuted church. In many ways, we understand the sorrow that they have when they see church doors close and things take place. And God, it hasn't gotten to the point where they've told us not to preach the gospel. But Lord, we understand a little bit more this weekend. And so we pray even more fervently for our brothers and sisters, God. We lift them up to you and pray that you bless them. It's in Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement. And we say... Amen, amen, amen. All right, well, today's your having a seat. Get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Colossians. We're gonna be in Colossians chapter number four and we're gonna be in the last two verses in the book of Colossians. This has been a four-part series that we're concluding today called The Lord's Work and Workforce. Now, I want to remind you of the things that we've already seen in this series. We've already seen that the Lord's work is for all of us. Now, we are God's workforce. If you're born of the Spirit of God, you are a part of the workforce of God. God has a ministry for you. I I just want to take a moment, and for all of us, I I want you to do something. I want everybody, within the sound of my voice, if you're born of the Spirit of God, and when I ask this question, I want you to just throw your hand up in the air and wave it, and I want you to give a whoop and a holler. Give a little woo, all right? So how many full-time ministers of the gospel do we have out there? That's what I thought, amen, I know. We're all a part of the workforce of God. And when we place the things that we do, our part may seem small to us, but small things become great things. They're very important in the eyes of God. Secular things become sacred things, and temporary things become eternal things when we place them in the hand of God. And you remember the last two times we were together, we talked about how God's workforce should be helpful and should be encouraging. Now, for those of you that are just joining us or if you missed any part of that, I want to encourage you to go to the the archives and make sure to get a hold of those messages because they will bless you and you will be able to get caught up with right where we're at today. But for today's purpose, we're going to continue to read And like I said, we're going to conclude the book of Colossians today. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 17 and verse number 18. Last two verses. Look at what it says. And it says, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Verse number 18, the salutation by my own hand. Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Grace be with you. Amen. Now let's back up to verse number 17. I want to just read it once again because this is really the emphasis and the focus of where the message is going to be at today. Colossians chapter 4 verse number 17 says, And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Can I tell you something today? For each and every one of us, that word is not just a word for Archippus, somebody who we don't know, somebody who we don't know that much about. Maybe he was a church leader in Colossae. Maybe he was one of the bishops or one of the elders. Maybe he was just one of the members of the church there. But it doesn't really matter that much because God contained this verse in the scriptures for thousands of years, not just for Archippus, even though that was a word for him, 
But he contained this word because it's a word for you and it's a word for me. God wants us to take heed to the ministry which we have received. As the workforce of God, God has a purpose. God has a plan. God has a destiny for you and me. And each and every one of us have a ministry which God has placed in our hands, a responsibility. And he says, I want you to take heed to the ministry which you have received from the Lord that you may fulfill it. That means that we all have a responsibility in some areas. If we've received this from the Lord, then we have a responsibility to do a couple of things with our ministry, with our personal full-time ministry that God has given to us. We need to make it personal. This is ours. We need to own it. And therefore, there's some things that we need to do that I want to just bring out of this scripture today. First thing is this, is take it seriously. Take your ministry seriously. Don't think of it as secondary to life. No, this is what life is all about. God gave you that job for you to be the full-time minister. Take it seriously. God gave you that home and that family for you to lead well. That is your primary ministry. God gave you the neighbors and the people that are in your life as a ministry. We need to take that seriously and understand that what we do as believers, as a part of the workforce of God, needs to be taken seriously. And it's a great honor because it comes from the Lord. I heard a story of a young man who traveled to Germany and saw a clockmaker making a cuckoo clock. Germany is famous for its cuckoo clocks. In fact, growing up, I remember my parents had one that we used to love. We'd wait for the hour to turn just to see that little guy come out. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. And so a young man traveled to Germany and he was going and he was watching a clockmaker carve out and make the cuckoo clock. And he's sitting there watching and this craftsman is carefully carving out and making different cuts and sanding things down. But he was going very methodically and he was going very slowly. And this young man started to get impatient. And he looked at it and he said, well, if you keep going like that, you're not going to make any money. And the clockmaker stopped for a moment. He looked up from his work and he said, son, I'm not making money. I'm making a cuckoo clock. See, all of us need to understand that what we do is not just what we do because that's the norm, that's the things that we're doing as people or society. We're not just floating around. This is not something that, that is secondary. No, it is primary. This is what we're doing because we've received this ministry from the Lord. We've received this stewardship. We've received the people in our lives. We've received the influence that we have. We have received all of these things from God because that is our ministry from God. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 14 through verse number 16, the apostle Paul is writing to his young protege, Timothy. And he says these words in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 14 through verse number 16. He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you. One of the greatest things that I see when I find Christians is that they have a gift that God has granted them and yet they're sitting on it. And God says, don't neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. You see, sometimes we think, well, I haven't had that moment like Timothy's had. I, I haven't had that time where somebody's prophesied over me. Maybe you have. I haven't had the elders lay hands on me. Maybe you have. But by and large, most of you probably have said, I've never had that moment. And so how does that work for me, Pastor? Well, can I tell you something? In this church, we've been prophesying, we've been declaring that you are the full-time ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore, you have received a gift. You've been given it by prophecy. When we've declared the word of the Lord to you, that is a prophetic word that now you've received something from God and God is saying to take it seriously. Verse 15, meditate on these things. Think about them, mull them over in your mind. Give yourself entirely to them. Take it seriously and then put your heart into it. Put your back into it. Come on, somebody. That your progress may be evident to all. Verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. The doctrine is simply the teaching that you've received. We've taught you well here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Listen to it. Be encouraged by it. Remind yourself of it. Look at what it says. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. We must give our ministries the attention that it deserves. Take it seriously. Second thing is this, is to trust God's working. We all need to trust God's working. You know what? During this time of uncertainty, when things are changing and communication is rapidly coming across and we're wondering, man, what's really going on? I, I wonder what's going to happen. It's easy to get off of trusting God. 
But at this moment, just like the Apostle Paul had written to Archippus under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, I know that God would have me to tell you, don't worry. Trust that God is working. He is moving on your behalf. God is going to work all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. We need to simply take a deep breath and trust that God is working. I heard the story of a man who walked up on a Little League baseball game and didn't know what was going on, and so he decided to walk up and take a look and talk to one of the boys that was there in the dugout, and he says, hey, what's the score? And the kid responded, well, it's 18 to nothing. We're behind. Woo, boy, said the spectator. I bet you're discouraged. And the little boy said, mm-mm, nope, I'm not. See, we haven't even gotten up to bat yet. See, Sometimes we get discouraged when we see that things aren't going our way. We get discouraged when we hear new reports coming out on the news every night. We get discouraged when we feel like things have been taken away from us or there's restrictions placed on us. And yet, this is our time. This is the moment for the church to shine brighter than it's ever shown before. If the Apostle Paul was able to do his ministry from a prison cell, then we can do ministry while we're social distancing. We can do ministry from self-quarantine or forced quarantine. We can do ministry from a hospital bed, from a home, from a device, a phone, you can do it with a letter in snail mail. It may look like we're behind, but just wait until the church gets up to bat. See, God wants to move during this time. And this is an opportunity for the church of Almighty God to be able to rise up and to do what God has called us to do. God wants to use you as a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philippians, in the book of Philippians, chapter number one, The Apostle Paul is writing from a prison cell. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 12 through verse number 14, he says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. See, we would have thought, Paul, you're in jail. You're restricted. I mean, you can't further the gospel from prison. It's over. And yet he says that God was working and God was using this situation to actually further the gospel. Verse 13, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest. You know what? That pretty much includes everybody, right? That my chains are in Christ. People knew what Paul was about. People knew why he was there. People knew what he was doing. People knew the message that he was preaching. Verse 14, and most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Man, how encouraging is it that Paul, being in prison, was able to give hope and encouragement and confidence to others who may have been timid before. I heard a story and received an email from the Voice of the Martyrs talking about how they have people in China that have found out that the believers are much more bold to speak during the time of the COVID-19 virus outbreak because everybody's got masks on. And so therefore, they're not going to be tagged. Cameras can't really tell who they are because they're covered up. And because they're covered up, now they're able to stop people and share the message of the gospel with them. They're on the streets. Whereas before, they wouldn't have been able to. But now, God has taken this opportunity to embolden his church. Come on, American church. Come on, those of you that are watching all over the world right now. Those of you that are getting this message, wherever you're at, it's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to take this opportunity. If ever the world needed the message of hope. If ever the world needed the message of the gospel, it is right now. Trust that God is working. And come on, workforce, boots on, straps up. Let's go with the things of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9, Paul actually says, which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. God's word cannot be stopped. It cannot be hindered. It cannot be broken. It is eternal. It is living and active, and it is moving forward on the earth today. And as the workforce of God, we are not bound. Even though we may be quarantined, even though we may have a stay-at-home order right now, guess what? The word of God's not chained. Let it loose. Speak it out. Declare it. Tweet it. Post it. Put a picture of it up on your Instagram. Take a video of you preaching the gospel. Get a hold of this. Get a hold of this word. Get a hold of this gospel. Get a hold of this Bible and start to declare it and give it to others who need the hope of Jesus Christ in your life. You are the full-time minister of the gospel. You are the workforce of God. Last thing for us today is this. Last thing for us today is this, is that we need to take it to the end. 
We need to take this ministry that we have received to the very end. I heard the story of a man who was, uh, you know, during this time of quarantine, during this time of only the essential services of food deliveries going out and that sort of a thing. And so every day he would order takeout from the same restaurant. He loved their soup. And so every day he would order the soup of the day. And so he would go there and he'd get the soup. And in the soup, they'd put a bowl with the soup in it. And then they would put two pieces of bread. And so every day he'd go in and he'd grab the bowl of soup and the two pieces of bread. He went home. The next day he came back and the, the, the store owner realized the same guy's coming back every day. And so he decided to ask him, hey, you, you like the soup? He goes, oh, I love the soup. He goes, yeah, okay, great. He says, just not enough bread for me. Only two pieces. And he goes, oh, okay. And so he, he stopped the people before they gave him his, his delivery for that day. And they said, all right, this time, you know, he wanted more bread. This guy's faithful. He's going to keep coming. We need to keep this business. And so he decides to put three pieces of bread in there. And so he sends him off, says, hope you enjoy your meal, sir. And the guy says, thank you very much, goes home, comes back the next day for his soup. And he says, hey, what did you think? What did you think? He says, oh, the soup is great, but it just wasn't enough bread. So this manager gets frustrated. He goes, okay, we're going to put four pieces of bread this time. So he sends him off with it. Next day he comes back. He says, what did you think? He says, oh, the soup is great, but I just needed more bread. And so this time he gets really frustrated. He says, that's it, that's it. I'm going to overwhelm this guy. He puts eight pieces of bread in with the soup. He says, I'm going to get him this time. And so the guy takes the soup, he goes home, and he comes back the next day, and the store owner goes, I know that I'm going to get him this time. I know that it's going to happen. He says, hey, what did you think of the soup? He says, man, I love the soup. Just wasn't enough bread. Oh, my goodness, the manager is so frustrated by this time. He is just beside himself. And so he decides he's just going to get a whole loaf. He cuts the thing just lengthwise into two pieces, butters them both, puts that massive thing in the bag, and he takes it back out to him and says, here you go. I want to know what you think of this tomorrow. So the man says, great, he takes it home. He comes back the next day. The store owner is just smug, knowing that he's gone way overboard. He can't wait to hear what this guy's gonna say. And so he says, hey, what did you think of the soup? And he says, oh, the soup is great, but I see you've gone back to doing just two pieces of bread again. See, sometimes we can get so disappointed by things that are going on around us. We can allow things to hinder us from being faithful. We can allow things to stop us. We can allow things to hold us back. And yet, God says, I want you to fulfill your ministry. Do what I have called you to do. Do it faithfully and do it to the end. I love what the book of Revelation says. It says, be faithful unto death. I know that's not very popular. I know that doesn't sound very happy. I know that that's not something that we like thinking about. And yet God is asking us to be faithful to the very end. And God wants to reward us in our faithfulness. God wants to welcome us into eternal dwellings with a well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that happens when we faithfully go out and do the ministry that God has given to us to do. Not looking over the fence, not looking over the line to see what someone else is running their race with. No, we have our own run. We have our own race. We have our own lane that we are to stand. God has called us to be faithful where we're at. Don't let anything discourage you, especially what other people have to say about you. Your praise, your reward comes from God. God is the one that we're trying to please, not man. God is not looking for numbers. He's not looking for crowds. He's not looking for money. He's not looking for sizes as much as he is looking for faithfulness and obedience. And when you are faithful and when you are obedient, in the eyes of God, you are successful. Let's take it to the end. Last scripture for today, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 6 through verse number 8. These are pretty much the last words that the Apostle Paul is speaking to Timothy, whom he calls his son. He loves him so much, loves him so dearly, and he's giving him these last words and these final instructions. And he says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. You can just imagine somebody with the wine pouring it out over the offering. And he says, in the time of my departure is at hand, verse number 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. Verse number eight, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Talking about the day of the Lord's return. And not to me only, but also to all who has loved his appearing. If you're waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're looking forward to that day, then guess what? You will receive the crown of righteousness just like the apostle Paul will on that day if you will remain faithful. If you'll fight the good fight, it's gonna be a fight to stay after your faith. It's gonna be a fight to continue on in these tough times. But I know that you're tough and I know that you can do it.
If you will finish the race that God has laid out for you, the things that God has placed in front of your feet, and if you will just simply keep the faith. Don't just engage church online, but be the church at home and in your spheres of influence. Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. And like the apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, grace be with you. I had a dream the other night, and I just want to quickly share this. And I had a dream that I was coming to the platform. I was walking around the church. You know how in dreams it can be a different place. It's not really the place that you're at. But I'm walking around, and I'm going different places, and I'm trying to find my way to the platform. And I go up these stairs, and as I walk up these stairs, I'm on this area that looks out over the congregation. The only problem is, is that the stage is way across the way and I'm looking at the backs of everybody in the congregation. I woke up from that dream just totally frustrated because there was no way that I could cross over and get to the platform. There's no way that I could do what I needed to do at that moment. And and I had this thought when I woke up from that dream that somebody has rearranged our lives. And now here we are all dealing with it, trying to figure things out. You probably feel frustrated. You probably feel like that. And yet, for all of us, we're here doing our part. I want to encourage you to fight the good fight of faith, to run your race, and to stay the course unto the end because God wants you to be the full-time minister. It may look different than what you're used to. It might be something that maybe has thrown you a curveball, and yet God is saying, I'm with you trust my working. Be faithful to do the work. Take heed to it. Take it seriously at this time. Don't let it lax just because you're not ushering here live in the church. Don't let it lax because you're not SPTing somebody face to face. Continue the ministry that God has given you to do. What does that look like? You know, oftentimes at the end of the church service, we take a moment of prayer, and I just want to lead you in this time of prayer. What is the ministry that you have received from the Lord? Remember, church is not done yet. Gather your family. If, if people have kind of gotten off and if they're daydreaming and maybe they're, they're getting, gather them together. This is a time to pray right now. What ministry have you received from the Lord? Just take a moment and pray and ask God, what is my ministry? Maybe you know your ministry. Maybe you've been involved in ministry for a while. So what does that ministry look like in this season? Just ask the Lord, God, what does this ministry that I've received, how how does that look with a stay-home order? God, how does that look with social distancing? God, how does that look in the midst of a crisis? How can you fulfill it? How can you do what God has asked you to do? Are there steps you need to take? Is there plans that God is giving you right now. Write those things down. This is what I'm going to do. Here's God's action plan to me. Take it seriously. Know that God is working and take it to the end. Fulfill the ministry that God has given to you. And as you do, as you walk in obedience, just like the Apostle Paul said, grace be with you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. God, it may seem impossible, but Lord, we know that you are the God who can do impossible things. And so, Father, in this moment, God, we want to come together as a community of believers in faith, believing you for great things. Help us, Lord, grace us for this time, for this season, for this hour. May we shine brighter than ever before. May we pray harder than we've ever prayed before. May we believe you, God, and do great and mighty, wonderful things. God, may stories and testimonies be told of this time, of this season, of this hour, Lord. May people actually say, man, I wish I was around during that time so that I could have been a part of what was going on. Father, we give you thanks and praise for it. I thank you, God, that your blessing will continue on in every home, in every family, in every gathering, Lord God. And that, Father, that we will be back together here live very soon. It's in Jesus' name. We're all in agreement. We say amen, amen, amen.